thing from last week about the suffering servant, and then I'm going to talk about um, something else uh, tonight. So let's pray. Lord, grateful for uh, your kindness and mercy to us. Uh, we pray a special prayer for those who are in harm's way in Florida uh, and in Georgia and uh, in South Carolina and, and wherever. We pray your uh, protection preservation be upon them. Uh, we've got maybe people we know or friends of friends or family or whatever. So we just pray that you be with them. Um, Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would attend to us both as we uh, study and as we pray and that you would lead us into uh, understanding of your word and your providence and your ways of executing your will walk in harmony with it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, so last week, um, I talked a little bit about the suffering servant and how, of course, Peter didn't think that that should happen, and then in the end, he saw its benefit and necessity. And I read just different things out of different texts, but one of the things that I don't know why I didn't uh, think of, um, but... Um, this is Genesis 3.15 and God is talking and he's talking to the devil and, or Satan and he says I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel and so the very first place where there is this prophecy of one who would put an end to the work of the devil is also a picture of a suffering servant. It's from the very beginning. So it doesn't just, you know, come about at some other time. It was the way in which God was going to accomplish the work of salvation, the deliverance of his people, um, and the, uh, the undoing of what sin and the devil had tried to do with our first parents promise is this person who would be a human being um, would crush the serpent's head but he would be bitten on his heel so to speak he would suffer as that occurred and I just thought you know I got home and I thought why did I not mention that because it's at the very beginning and then it's just fleshed out throughout the rest of the scripture so anyway all right so tonight um I get this a lot, um, I guess because I'm a pastor, or I hear it a lot, um, and that's this idea about regeneration. Does it, you know, and this is a difference between, um, people want to say it's between, um, you know, reformed faith and uh, non-reformed faith, or between Calvinism and between Arminianism. Um, and I don't, I don't like to get into all those categories of stuff because I just think it's Bible and I just want us to look at the Bible. So I'm in Genesis. I'm going to, I'm going to read a couple of things. And I want, I want us to think about this idea of um, new birth, regeneration, a change of heart, a change of mind, a change of will, um, um, new man. So those are some biblical terms. Um, and so I just wanna, I wanna go, I'm gonna start with Genesis 2, and I'm gonna go with Jeremiah 13, then I'm gonna go with John 3, and then I'm gonna go with Ephesians 2. So I'll, I'll tell you what those are. So Genesis 2, 16 and 17. So Eve has not been created yet. This is just Adam. And God tells him this. This is, this, is the, this is the commandment that God gave to Adam. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. 
So in verse 16, he says, you may surely eat. And uh, Hebrew says, eating you may eat. There is a, um, an openness to Adam and his posterity that if he were to keep this commandment, he could just eat as much as he wanted. So there's no issue about, I'm starving, I've got to eat from the tree that's forbidden. It's eating you may eat. I'm going to bless you with a super abundance, and you can have as much as you want. So he's given him an orchard, and there's no need to eat from the one tree, right? Um, and then he warns Adam, um, he warns him that uh, in the day that he, if he were to eat it, if he were to eat it, it says, you shall surely die. So surely is in verse 16 and surely is in verse 17. And basically it's just a redundancy. It's eating you will eat, dying you will die. And they just it's just saying like, this is a serious thing. Seriously, you can have as much food as you want. There's no issue. Just enjoy. Be blessed. But with the superabundance of food, is going to be a superabundance of death. Okay. So there's a warning there. And, of course, we know from Genesis chapter 3 that Adam and Eve ate of that tree. And dying they shall die. And that's exactly what happened. And there's some people who would be, would be like, well, God's talking to them. They didn't die. So what was up with that? And they began the, the place of degradation of their bodies. He didn't just immediately execute them. They began to die physically, but worse, they died spiritually. They were cut off from God immediately, which is why they sowed fig leaves and ran away and hid because they knew something just happened. Something just happened. And now I'm cut off from myself, I'm cut off from my bride or my groom, and now I'm cut off from God, and I'm just going to flee from everybody. So that was immediate. And then we see the result of that in chapter 4 when uh, Cain kills Abel. It's just the natural outworking of sin in the heart. You've got to, you're a spiritually dead person, and the result of that is I'm going to murder other people. People. I'm going to take their lives for my own benefit. Um, and that's just, if, you, if we just looked at the book of Genesis early on, there's just a lot of that. Uh, Lamech is one of those people, just, it's, just, it's just a mess of a thing um, culminating with God saying, I've just got to start over. And, uh, you know, Noah, then you got the Tower of Babel, and God's just like, okay, I've got to, I'm going to institute this other program. Uh, not that God's confused, but he's just trying to minimize the effects of sin in the lives of people. So the death came when they ate the fruit in Genesis 3, and it was actually um, God honored his word. He, he told them what was going to happen. They disobeyed, and they suffered a soul death. They suffered a, a, a spiritual death. Not a soul death, because your soul didn't have it. A spiritual death. All right, so that that's in operation, and we you could just read the Old Testament and find out all the ways that that looks. It's just awful. You can look at the news every night. Um, it's just there, there. There's nobody that says, yeah, this this is this world is Nirvana or Shangri La or whatever. Nobody says that. It's just what people. The the thing about Critiques against God have to do with um, why why does He not get rid of this awfulness? Um, and so we look to Jesus and say, well, He He has, and it's in Him. But if you're outside of Him, then why why do you think He'd be good to you? But um, Jeremiah thirteen twenty two and twenty three. So God's people would say, if you say in your heart. Why have these things come upon me? And this is judgment, right? This is judgment. Um, 
Why, why, is this bad, why do these bad things happen to me? It is for the greatness of your iniquity that your skirts are lifted up. So it's shame, you know, right? Shame. You know, we just, you got shucked or you got, you got on a long robe and you got your pants pulled up while you're standing in line, you'd be embarrassed. Um, that your skirts are lifted up and you suffer violence. And then, and here's the point. Can the Ethiopian change his skin, right? So he's talking about people from Africa and they're dark. And can that person just say, oh, I'm going to go take a bath and wipe that off. And, you know, I'm going to get rid of this color of my skin. And the answer is no. Uh, or can the leopard change his spots? And the answer is no. It's who you are. It's, it's what makes you you as an Ethiopian or as a leopard. Um, and then it says, then also you can do good who are accustomed to do evil. And the point is that an Ethiopian can't change his skin, a leopard can't change his spots, and evildoers can't do good. It's impossible. They're incapable. It's part of the nature of someone. And it's come from Adam and Eve down through all of their posterity. And God is saying, you cannot do this on your own. You can't change who you are. And he's trying with the Ten Commandments say, look, you, you, like, here, here's my standard. Keep it. And he's begging a question like, Lord, I can't do it. Lord, have mercy on me. Uh, I'm a sinner, and I would love to keep these commandments, but I, I can't do it. I can't do it. So the Jews tried for a long time. They still try. Just, you know, setting up rules. Well, you know, this doesn't really mean this, or that doesn't mean that, or, you know. And it's just, it's an impossibility. And so God's trying to teach his people, you need me involved in this work of salvation. And then in John chapter 3, we go on into the New Testament. And so, of course, um, we found it there at the very end of Mark. Um, I don't know, well, I borrowed out of another gospel. But Nicodemus, who Jesus meets with here in John 3, uh, becomes uh, uh, doesn't become a believer after the resurrection. He just uh, exposes himself as a as a believer. He's I think he, he's a believer before that, but at, at the end he's um, just says like I I, I want to be identified as a, a Christ follower. And so in John three three through six, Jesus. Um, and it says, Jesus answered him, Nicodemus, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And the word uh, cannot means he is not able. He doesn't have the power. It's, it's beyond him. It's an impossibility. The word is very, very, very strong that unless you're born again, you have no ability to even see the kingdom of God, okay? So it, it's an impossibility, and so Nicodemus responds to that. And so Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born. So automatically he doesn't, he, he's already showing the validity of what Jesus just said. He, he can't even comprehend it. And so he starts talking out of an earthly view, right? And Jesus gets to that later. He's like, you know, <laughs> how will you even understand heavenly things, you know? It's like, dude, you know. Um, so Nicodemus said, how can a man be born again to his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born 
again. And so, here again, Jesus speaking very clearly about this work of God by the Spirit has got to come before somebody can even see God's kingdom, before they can even comprehend who Jesus truly is, before they even want him, they have got to be born from above. And it's only then that their eyes are opened, their minds are opened, their hearts are changed. That's, um, I think, Ezekiel, um, I didn't put it down here, Ezekiel maybe 36 or 7, 36. Um, this whole idea of a new heart. You had a heart of stone in Adam and Eve. When you were born, you were knit together in your mother's womb in iniquity, and you have this heart of stone. It's hard, and you have blind eyes and deaf ears. You have a mind that's dull, and you have a neck that's stiff, <laughs> and we're obstinate in our wills, and we're opposed to God, and God says in you know Romans 3, I think starting with verse 10 and following, nobody seeks after God. There's nobody righteous. Nobody seeks after God. And that's God's testimony about humanity. And there's something about us. We just don't like his pronouncement upon us. But it's an, it's a, it's an honest assessment of where we are outside of Christ. And it's actually a mercy. So, you know, if Susie, when she had breast cancer, if she had gone to her uh, her doctor and her doctor would have seen that and just said, ah, you know, it's not that bad. Work real hard, cut out sugar, um, walk a little bit, get some good sleep, then I think you can beat it. Uh, she'd be dead, right? And so God doesn't do that. He just, right to the point, we need some heart surgery, I'm going to do it, and I do it, you'll be okay. And then the person has got to relinquish, like to say, okay, I want you to do this because I can't do it myself. And so, John 3, 3 through 6, um, and then John 6, I think 44, Jesus says, no one can come to me but the Father draw him. So there's a barrier there Unless God, unless God is operative in bringing people even to Christ because they can't see Christ, they don't want Christ, they're not interested in Jesus, they don't understand, they can't see the benefits of who he is, his person, his work, his nature. And so God then, wooingly, kindly, lovingly, generously, applies the work of Jesus to this person, opens their eyes, opens their hearts, and it's a logical thing, because those things kind of regeneration and faith, uh, um, I won't say every time, but normally, because I believe that maybe children who die in birth or those types of things, they may have regeneration and they don't have the capacity to exercise faith, but they're still saved or whatever. But, but normally, the regeneration um, is a logical thing and it's expressed in somebody's profession of faith, a real profession of faith, an honest holding on and grabbing on to Jesus alone as their Lord and Savior. And then so turn over to Ephesians chapter 2. And, you know, I could look at the golden chain of salvation from Romans 8, but, but this one is uh, very clear to me. And I'm going to read this whole passage, 1 through 9, and I want you to hear about like, where, where were you in your trespasses and sins, and what was God doing, and what was the result of what God did to those who were dead in their trespasses and sins. So follow along, uh, Ephesians 2, 1 through 9. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature, there it is, we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So everybody 
is like that. Children of wrath. By nature, it was just who we were. But God, very strong, that's the A-L-L-A -L -L -A, um, in the Greek, not the D-E, and it's a, that's a stronger, like, the, you know, an abrupt thing. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one may boast. And so there it is right there. So... We were dead in our trespasses and sins. God made us alive together with Christ. There's the new birth. And following that, then, we put our faith in him. And all the glory goes to God. We get all the benefit. We get the full restoration. We're called sons and daughters of God. We have an inheritance in the eternal realms that will never be taken from us. We're in union with Christ from before the foundation of the world. And this is the, the fruit of the work of Jesus. When he bruises the head of the serpent, he bruises the head of the serpent for us as well. So that there's no claim on our lives anymore. It breaks the power of sin and opens our eyes, changes our hearts, gives us a new nature, as well as appeases the wrath of God for us. So that the only thing that flows to us now is full acceptance and justification from God towards us. And it's by grace. Free, unmerited Faith is necessary. Repentance is necessary. But both of those have been earned and won by Christ and are also gifts given to his people and will be 100% exercised by the people for whom Christ died. So it's a, like to me, it's very biblical. If you read back, through the scripture and you have these things in mind it becomes more and more clear that God's the author of our salvation. Mm -hmm. It's there in Genesis chapter 3 and it works its all it works its way all the way through the Bible and all glory goes to God. All right. Well, let's take some time to pray to this God uh, who's the author and the perfecter of our faith, our salvation. We've got five verses in Psalm 100. And, uh, we've got one, two, three, four. I'll pray for as many as I need to. Let's pray. Lord, these are often difficult things for us to hear. This whole idea of, um, I think, how uh, it's been phrased, bondage of the will. Um, I've, I've read um, papers by very famous pastors who say things like, no, I'm not dead in my sins. I can do this and I can do that and you can do this. You can drive a car. You have a will. You can you know, sit here or you can sit there. Uh, but there's a very great mistake by ignoring just the few passages that I read uh, that are your word to your people. Um, sure, there's a free offer of the gospel. Jesus says, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden. He also says that he would never uh, cast off or turn aside anybody that came to him. They're, he's open. He's willing to receive anybody. Uh, the problem is, is that 
according to Romans 3, nobody wants to come. Uh, and so you, as we see in Ephesians 2, uh, renew and regenerate and change people's hearts and minds, and give them a new heart where they do desire to come. And as you enlighten us and change us, and give us a new heart, a new mind, eyes to see, ears to hear. We find Jesus just as lovely as he truly is. And we want him more than anything else. And so there might be a fear. Oh, Lord, you don't, you don't know what I was like. Uh, you don't know the things I've done. And um, God says, no, I, I know. <laughs> you were dead in your trespasses and sins, but I've made you alive together with Christ. Now come to Jesus. Come. He will receive you. Don't fear in coming to him. He will wrap his everlasting arms around you and keep you and guard you. And we will seal you by the Holy Spirit that you might know you are ours forever and ever. And so, Lord, when we turn to something like Psalm 100, uh, we see pray for all creation to joyfully and audibly praise Yahweh. Make a joyful noise uh, to the Lord, Yahweh, all the earth. And that's the right and fitting thing for the creation to do. Um, Lord, you're the creator of the heavens and the earth. That's a, a mirrorism in the Bible. It's a, a, it bookends. It's A to Z. It's top to bottom. It's an all-encompassing something. So you're the one who has made all things. And there's nothing that exists except for what you have made. And so everything is creation creature other than you. And we, as creation and creature, are to gladly, happily, audibly, um, verbally, give you the praise that you are due. And we pray that this desire would be spread among all creation. And we know that the sun and the moon and the stars, and the mountains and the waves and the oceans and the hills and the valleys all proclaim your glory. We pray that humanity that has been made in your image would follow suit. That we having been renewed by your Holy Spirit, would gladly worship you. Our maker, our sustainer, our redeemer, our Lord, our Father, our King, our Master. We pray it in Jesus' name.
We pray for Yahweh's grace to flourish throughout all generations. Psalm 100, verse 5, for the Lord is good, Yahweh's good. His steadfast love endures forever. And his faithfulness to all generations. And in the New Testament, we hear about the word grace a lot. And it's this free, unmerited gift. It's uh, something that comes from God and the heart of God that's given to people indiscriminately because God's heart is large and good and kind. Uh, in this word here, steadfast love, is that same word in the Old Testament. It's the word hesed. And it endures forever uh, because Yahweh is good. Because he's good, his love flows to his people forever and ever and ever. His faithfulness, his steadfastness, his interest in keeping and guarding and preserving his people isn't for one generation, but to all generations of his people. And so we delight in the fact that our loved ones who were in Christ before us will see again in heaven and that the ones who have come after us we think about little children here in the church that we love so much that your faithfulness your steadfast love your grace is extended to them in Christ as well and so there's a family type of atmosphere that will populate heavenly kingdom. And it all comes down to the fact that you are loving and good and kind. For when our first parents fell into sin, you could have cast them out completely, not just from the Garden of Eden, which happened, but from your very presence, your loving presence, your kind like you did with the angelic host who fell in Satan. But you did not do that. You made the kind intention of your will known. And we see the penultimate demonstration and illustration of steadfast love in the cross of Christ. And so Lord made that type of love, this sacrificial love of a suffering servant may it be known throughout all generations